Well, good evening and a very, very warm welcome to each and every one of you here to St. Paul's as we begin our Autumn Forum series. This year, exploring how to change the world. And tonight, focusing on compassion. My name is Mark Oakley, and it's my great joy to be chairing the series and, of course, welcoming and introducing our speakers, which I will do in just a moment. But for those of you who haven't been to one of our events before, let me quickly explain the format. In a moment, Camilla Batmangelich and Karen Armstrong will speak about the power of compassion to change the world. If you have a question, please, at any stage, write it out on the back of your leaflet and hold it up to be collected. We won't think that you want to be excused and you need the toilet. We will know that you have written down a question and someone will come and collect it from you and those people will be collecting the questions throughout the evening until about 7.30. Please, please make sure the question is brief and legible and then your questions with the amazing technology of the Church of England will appear before me on a screen and I'll be able to voice some of them for you. So I'll be looking at your questions. I'm not catching up on Downton, uh, if you're just wondering what I'm doing. We'll then end promptly at 8 o'clock, and both speakers' books will be for sale here, and uh, the uh, speakers have very kindly agreed to sign your copies. There will also be an opportunity to donate to the amazing work done by Camilla's charity, Kids Company, and also to learn more about the Charter for Compassion. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Karen Armstrong is one of the world's leading scholars on the world's religions, on spirituality and on justice, and the best-selling author of many books, including The History of God and The Case for God. Her breadth and depth of study is quite outstanding, and for many of us, she has brought a badly needed intelligence and accessibility to the public arena's thinking about religion at a time when many like to dismiss it as simply childish, irrational, or neurotic. That may well describe the clergy, but not the rich, the ancient poetic wisdom and practice of the great world's faiths. And we have Karen to thank for opening up a more truthful and perceptive conversation about the role of religion in the past and future, for which she has quite rightly received many awards and honors. A passionate campaigner for religious liberty, she has addressed the United States Congress and Senate and has participated in the World Economic Forum, purely, of course, as warm-ups for the St. Paul's Forum here tonight. She is the founder of Charter for Compassion, a global peace initiative launched in 2009, which works with businesses and cities and schools and communities across the world to create and embed cultures of compassion, and which I'm sure she will tell us more about. Camilla batman Gelich is a psychotherapist and the founder and director of Kids Company, a charity providing practical, emotional, and educational support to 36,000 vulnerable children, young people, and parents. She, too, is a remarkable human being whose pioneering work is based in the principles of relentless love and emotional regeneration. And she has transformed the lives of thousands of children. She has received numerous awards for her work, including in 2009, the Women in Public Life Award, Businesswoman of the Year, 
and earlier this year she was made CBE for her work on behalf of underprivileged children. She is also one of the very few people to be distinguished enough and alive at the same time to be a postcard in the National Portrait Gallery shop. <laughs> Would you please be kind enough to welcome our two speakers tonight? And now I invite Camilla to speak to us. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to say, uh, please, could you not take any photographs of me while I'm talking, because I'm a bit neurologically challenged, and then I forget what I'm saying. You can take as many as you want afterwards, but not while I'm talking. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be here, to be able to speak to you, and I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss with you what I learned from the children I work with at Kids' Company about the power of compassion. Some 17 years ago, a small team and I began in some railway arches. Our intention was to work with children who were vulnerable in schools just during the holidays and then return them back to school. But what actually happened is that within weeks, we ended up with some hundreds of adolescent boys from the local gangs, and then subsequently with a group of severely malnourished under 11-year-olds who were scavenging in bins for food. And what really struck me about these children is how similarly disturbed they were. They used to smash their heads into glass, lock themselves in the toilets, break pieces of furniture, attempt to cut themselves. And I never forgot a teenage girl who used to lie on her belly and then slam her head into the concrete for an hour and a bit till the blood flowed. And I never really understood why these children harmed themselves so much and harmed other people and why so quickly they exploded into a fight and potentially really devastated their opponent and then stood in shock at what they were doing and couldn't believe that such ferocious force was releasing itself from inside them. When I interviewed some 400 of these kids in great detail, it was with great sadness that I found out that every single one of them had been chronically abused and neglected as toddlers. Many of them had been horrifically violated within the family home and then had attempted to run away in order to seek sanctuary somewhere else and were sadly further violated by street criminality or completely often ignored by the social care agencies around them who were very depleted. I didn't know what to do. I'd studied as a psychotherapist. I'd done Jung, Freud, Klein. But I was completely skillless, paralyzed by these children's ferocious rage and their absolutely dark despondency. And it was over a period of time that I began to understand that I needed to really comprehend what drove these kids to the point of this type of behavior. So I sent someone out to get me 500 clinical papers on the brain. Uh, so that maybe I could find out what it was about these kids. And when I read these papers, and I did read all 500 of them, I realized that if all these international scientists had come together and shared their knowledge, they would have been able to collectively find explanations for why these children behaved in this way. 
Armed with that half-baked knowledge of an amateur, I approached the British Medical Society to ask them to help me put together this country's best experts in neuropsychiatry, neuropsychology, to try and look at this group of children and try and understand a little better what was causing their difficulties. The results of this research that's been carried out is now becoming available. UCL found that one in five of the children that they looked at had been shot at and or stabbed. 50% of the children had witnessed shootings and stabbings in the last year. One in four of their immediate family members and friends had been shot at and or stabbed. Incidence of sexual abuse of the group was 13 times more than controls in the neighborhood. And accumulatively, they'd had something like 11.5 times more accumulative traumas, a number of neglect, abuse incidents, and so on. But what was fascinating is that I noticed the children that were in our care were beginning to get better. And as the scientists were coming forward with their research, and we were doing our work of taking care of these kids, something came together which was extraordinary and yet so simple. It is love that builds the key fabric of the brain. You need the front part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, to calm down the predominantly emotionally driven parts of your brain, your limbic system, which is deep inside your brain. The children we looked after were being completely devastated by the amount of fright hormone they were chronically exposed to. And this was leading to dysregulations in the emotional parts of their brain. Ideally, they should have been able to use the front part of their brain to calm themselves down. But many of them couldn't do that because simply they hadn't had enough attachment, love and care to be able to have a robust strategy but also a robust neuroarchitecture to be able to do the self-soothing and self-calming that is needed. The people who give you your ability to care for yourself are primarily your significant carers, like your mother and your father, and perhaps others around you who function like mothers and fathers. And in receiving that care, the idea is that you develop inside yourself a kind of a model of how to care for yourself once the carer is no longer available in body and around you. The children we cared for had been robbed of that internalization of a carer. This meant that they were bereft of a model to manage their own emotions and energy. But it also meant that, in a way, the robustness that was needed wasn't available at a neurophysiological level. Where compassion comes in is in the fact that our workers, despite not giving birth to these children, were able to love them enough to be able to reparent them and function as additional parental figures in their lives, either strengthening these children's biological carers, supplementing their care, or completely substituting, so that the child could develop the internalized care model, but also develop the architecture needed to regulate emotion and energy. What is very exciting about our understanding of neuroscience is that we've come to the realization now 
that genetics determines a boundary for your development, but the quality of your development and its characteristic is predominantly dictated by the kind of care that you receive. The mistake Western society often makes is that it believes only the biological carer has the right to parent. The bond between a child and their biological carer is absolutely sacred and unique. But even beyond that, there are lots of people who can give care. And it's the fact that as human beings, we have the capacity to imagine the pain and the existence of somebody else and be in tune with their need and meet their need that makes us so unique as a species. So I learned something very important, which is that the path to recovery for these children was fundamentally about exercising compassion to understand where their disturbance came from, putting ourselves in the shoe of the disturbed child, and then dealing with that disturbance through a strategy of unrelenting love. Unrelenting, because when you first give love, these children find it unbearable, and they want to destroy you and the attachment that you provide. It is for you to stand there through that and see it through so that you can come out on the other side. And then to conclude, where does the God fit in all this? Because ultimately, one of the greatest compassions exercised by human beings is often through an act of faith. I believe it is very important for people to be able to have a faith if they choose it, and if it's helpful to them. Because in believing in a force beyond yourself, who acts as a protector and a kind of a guide through your life, you have got there the ultimate loving parental figure. Ideally, children should have that experience viscerally, through the kind of care they receive from another human being. But in the precariousness and the absence of care in a lot of these children's lives, having faith can be a real anchor and a secure base to make up for the fact that the carer they would like to have in their lives is not always available. So from children that you would never think could teach you that, we learned the transformative power of compassion and the potency of unrelenting love. And we learned that it is clinically actually a very valid strategy because in conditions of loving, your brain develops a neurochemical state of resilience which protects you against reacting negatively towards stressful stimulus. And I think we're at the point of a very exciting paradigm where, for those who don't believe in it, biology is fundamentally going to produce the evidence for compassionate care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I was most inspiring. Um, I came to compassion not through human contact, uh, but by books. Um, I started out being very hostile to faith. I'd had a bad time as a young woman in r religious life and wanted nothing to do with it ever again. But after a series of career disasters, I found myself writing books about religion, very sort of aggressive books at first. But gradually, it's a long story, um, 
I kept whatever I was studying, and this was after I'd begun to uh, adopt, begin to understand what religion was really about. Um, I kept being confronted with the issue of compassion, whether I was talking about a history of God or a history of Jerusalem or um, a history of Islam. Uh, a history of fundamentalism even, I kept being drawn by the material to compassion. And I found that every single one of the major world religions has developed this ethic of compassion. And it's summed up in the golden rule, which has been uh, formulated independently in every single one of these faiths. Never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself and said that that, not a correct doctrine or a particular ethical practice, but compassion, that golden rule, is the test of true spirituality. Um, and yet, I kept being frustrated because you don't hear much about it very often. Um, all too often when religious people to get together, Uh, they um, are condemning something or speaking out against um, a particular doctrinal or uh, ethical abuse. And yet, what well, I'm convinced that the w compassion is key to the survival of our world. I sometimes go around giving a lecture uh, called Compassion, Nice Idea or Urgent Global Imperative. Um, because I'm now convinced that unless we learn to implement the golden rule globally so that we treat all peoples, whoever they are, as we would wish to be treated ourselves, the world is not going to be a viable place. Um, and so when I heard that I'd won the TED Prize in 2008, um, they give you a wish your prizes, they give you some money, but more importantly, they give you a wish to make a better world. And I ask them to help me to create, craft, and propagate a charter for compassion that was composed by leading activists uh, representing six of the major world religions, um, which, uh, which should be a call to action to say that despite all our interesting uh, differences, on this we were all in agreement, and we could reach across the confessional divides and work together for a better world. The golden rule requires you, as Confucius said, all day and every day to look into your own heart, discover what gives you pain, and then refuse under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. Never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. And notice all day and every day. We often have a saying, don't, practice, don't we, where we've done something nice for somebody, of saying, well, that's my good deed for the day as though we could then return for the next 23 hours to our usual unkindness and greed and bitterness. No, all day and every day. To, and, and this, they said, brings you into contact with what we call God or Brahman, Nirvana or Tao. Why? Because what holds us back from enlightenment and our best selves is our ego. Uh, we are sort of preoccupied with ourselves. We have to be, biologically we have to be, to ensure the survival of our species. Uh, but um, we also find, uh, the, when we live together, we have uh, to put that ego to one side. If you're doing compassion all day and every day, you have all day and every day to dethrone that self from the center of the world and put another person there, imaginatively, intelligently. Um, and if we'd done this in the past uh, with some of our colonies and mandates and protectorates, 
I don't think we'd be having so many political problems today. Uh, so it is an urgent need for, uh, that, that, we, that we get this going. And so um, after we'd written the charter and given it out to the world, it's, it's, it's quite short, 350 words long, um, we didn't quite know what was going to happen. And then all kinds of people came out of the woodwork. Uh, including, and this was a great surprise to me, businessmen and women. Now, I could never have envisaged that because I have the business head of a chicken. I'm the despair of my accountants. Uh, but um, they, it's wonderful because they understand how to take an, an idea, a quixotic idea, and make it a practical going concern. And so we've now got, um, we, so, some of them decided to create a network of compassionate cities. Uh, Seattle in uh, the United States was the first to declare itself a city of compassion, and it got the mayor to endorse the charter. Uh, but it's not just a sort of love-in day. You have to do something practical each year, working together, uh, to uh, improve the, the, the quality of, uh, of compassion in the city uh, on, in a practical project. It might be an environmental project or a legal project or a um, you know, problem with the elderly or healthcare, but to work practically. And the idea always being to bring compassion from the lumber room to which it's often relegated in modern culture to the forefront of consciousness. Um, and now we've got uh, 20 uh, compassionate cities worldwide um, and 130 cities going through the process of becoming compassionate cities, fully in endorsed. Um, and I, I, I was asked by, uh, well, uh, on a tel teleconference, how would you define a compassionate city? And I said, I would see it as an uncomfortable city. I don't want the Charter for Compassion to degenerate into a kind of, as I say, love-in. Um, we should be uncomfortable about the state of our world. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that not one Muslim could be a believer if he could sleep when he knows that somebody is in his vicinity is hungry. Now, we've created a global village um, but our perceptions haven't yet caught up with that reality. We still put our, tend to put ourselves and our own culture and our own country in a special privileged category. And we say uh, dreadful things about other people. We're very omniscient in the way that we speak about other people. Oh, well, the trouble with her is. As though you could sum up uh, the entire mystery of a human being in a single sentence, and we do it with whole cultures, whole peoples, whole civilizations. Um, and sometimes when people do this, it's, if you know something about the subject under discussion, it's quite clear that what the amount of reliable information they actually have could be comfortably contained on the back of a small postcard. But this is dangerous. Uh, and so one of the things that has been very thrilling to me is the way that this has been taken up in the Muslim world. Pakistan is one of the leaders of the charter. Young businessman there, uh, they can't join in the city's campaign because of their civil war. They'd probably all get blown up. Um, and when I went to uh, launch the charter uh, there a couple of years ago, it was a most uncompassionate schedule, I have to say. It was three major lectures a day in, all over Pakistan. And, but thousands of people came each time because they felt this was their last chance, especially young people. This young businessman is creating a network of schools of compassion uh, where they're introducing uh, the ideal of compassion into core subjects in the curriculum um, and um, two members of staff have every three months to come for training in compassion. And the 
results on the ground have been astonishing, he said. People were saying at first, don't tell me about compassion. We all know what it is. Uh, but when they finally get it deeply into it and find out what it means, uh, they, people are in tears. And they, the compassion at school has to be compassion. It has to be for everybody, for the teachers, for the dinner ladies, for the people who clean the, the classrooms, for the groundsmen, for everybody. It's got to be a compassionate um, uh, community. And um, we are, uh, at the moment, we're up to 40 schools of compassion. And Amin tells me that within five years, he's going to have a thousand schools, and he'll do it. This young man should get the Nobel Prize for what he's doing. Uh, uh, one of the problems I've had, um, even with the Compassionate uh, Cities Network, when I forgot to tell you that a few months ago, the Mayor's Conference in the United States endorsed the Charter and uh, suggested that all cities in the United States adopted it. But one of the problems I have is to get people to think globally. They still have the idea that compassion is being nice and they'll have a nice, soft, peaceful time, but not really willing to sort of get... Uh, my dream, uh, when we're further down the road, is to have twinning cities so that we can have a city in the United States twinned with a city in the Muslim world and that they can interact, have electronic friendships and arrange exchanges and visits, and somehow some of the misapprehensions about ourselves can get whittled down. Uh, so we're going to take a new step forward. Instead of having it all run, uh, actually, from Seattle, as it has been, we're going to create a new international uh, um, sort of substructure where there are various hubs. The United States is one. Um, and Pakistan will be another. Indonesia, where I went a couple of months ago, which is a gog to, to put the charter into... into um, Jakarta is becoming a, 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 a city of compassion, and Bali is going to become an island of compassion. Um, in, and Jordan, um, South Africa, Canada, and the United States. So that we have all this global outlook and we're beginning to work together across the divide to create a better world. Um, we often sort of say, oh, I wish someone would do something. But we all can do this. We can all do this by increasing global awareness, realizing how little we know about other people's, other, other people's histories of pain and suffering and abuse in, in their countries. Um, and people have been abused by bad, bad governance, by colonial um, subjugation. Um, and like, uh, like your children, they are disturbed. Uh, but the response has been great. Um, we all have to do what we can in our spheres. So that if you're a, a teacher or a, a lawyer or a dog walker or a hairdresser, what can you do to make your profession a kinder, more considerate and respectful place? And I think that is the task of our time, so that we can build a global community where people of all ethnicities and all ideologies can learn to live together in mutual respect. Because if we don't achieve that, the world will not be a viable place. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Camilla and uh, Karen. And now, of course, it is over to you, uh, the audience. I've seen lots of hands going up with questions, and some are starting to come through. But please do write down your questions and hold them up for collection. While that's uh, happening, I wondered if I could just start um, and ask you both something. I was just hearing about Seattle and, uh, and the global uh, focus for compassion. Here we are, 
in St. Paul's Cathedral in the middle of the city of London. We're in the wake of a financial crisis, but of course I think that phrase is far too reductive because surely it was a human crisis, not a financial crisis. Money, it was really the metaphor through which we could see something of who we had become. And a lot of talk going on about when will the crisis be over, when actually the more urgent question is how will this crisis change us? How would the city of London, how would banking, business, capitalism be changed if the city of London became one of your compassionate cities? Well, uh, miracles can happen, of course. <laughs> um, I remember on the day I launched the charter, uh, going around Washington and uh, to you know, give interviews and panels and things, and finally ended up at the BBC outlet. Uh, the very well-known looking um, uh, interviewers l looked at me and said, well, this is a loony idea, isn't it? And I thought, home sweet home. Uh, but one of the things that has interested me, as I say, is that businessmen are behind this. They're, they're not particularly religious, these people. Um, they have found, they looked into the abyss of 2008 and saw what happened when um, greed and selfishness and just concern for material things got out of control. And when we first approached the president of Starbucks, Howard, in, uh, in Seattle, he said, oh, don't give me this rubbish, you know, no. Uh, but when I went back last year, he was sitting beside me on the panel, and he told a story about his father, who'd been a greengrocer. And he said he used to notice that his father would pop into a bag, some, someone's bags, a, a little plummet of strawberries or a few bananas. And he said, Dad, why are you doing this? And his father said, look, I know these people. And I know they like to eat bananas and strawberries, and if they're not buying them, it means there's something wrong at home. And if you do this, uh, you, it, and it is good for business. They, these people come back. Uh, and that's, so there are people that out there, and there are uh, businessmen at Harvard and people writing about this, that it's time now, the only way for us to survive is not just to leech out of the community, but to put something back, to use all that expertise we have and bring, put something back. Now, it's hard to say a city of London, like, like the city of Washington, too, has the same problem, can be a city of compassion when it's also a seat of government and has often had to do really awful things. But I think we have to understand that um, compassion is a survival kit. People in the business world are realizing that uh, it's not that you can't just go on behaving in this leech-like way. Uh, but we, it's like, it's, but I'd say the same with the environment. It takes a spiritual change. It means that we have to be prepared for change, to, to uh, take on a new way of life, perhaps to do without some of the stuff that we uh, are endlessly accumulating. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, go deeply into ourselves and look deeply at our society. It can't be a quick cosmetic fix. Mm -hmm. Camilla, do you have anything to add to, to that particular theme? Um, I just think that you have to be very careful not to industrialize compassion because um, there's a trend in the city of doing um, sort of packages of volunteering and philanthropy, and a lot of companies are doing it because they need to be seen to be doing it. And that's an abuse of compassion. Having said that, kids' companies survived, let's say, from January this year till August because of 44,000 different sources of donations. And a lot of those people are people who work in the city, complete strangers, 
who've decided to do something for a vulnerable child by contributing their money. And what I've seen is brick by brick, our organization being built up as a result of the compassion of complete strangers. So I'm very hopeful, but at the same time, I think we have to be guarded not to manufacture, package, and deliver pseudo-compassion in order to be seen to be contributing to the community. Thank you. And thank you to uh, you out there, because the uh, questions are coming in fast and furious, so let's, let's get going on them. Um, several people have asked, the benefits of compassion are clear. Why do we find it so hard to be compassionate with one another? Is it a failure of willpower? I suppose we're asking, how natural is it to be compassionate? <laughs> Do you want to? Um, I don't think it's a failure of willpower. I believe people uh, first need to meet their own needs. And only when they've achieved some kind of stability in themselves do they look out to other people and see how they can bring along someone else into this state uh, of comfort. So I guess for some people, they're in more comfortable positions and they can begin to imagine the condition of another human being. For others, their preoccupation is their own survival. And we mustn't judge it. It's what people are capable of, truthfully, at any given point in their lives. Mm -hmm. Karen. It is a constant struggle. We all recognize compassion when we see it and we want to see it, and we look for it in people. People flock in thousands to hear the Dalai Lama, for example. Um, and, you know, we've got all these centers in our brain, have we not, you know, that, that help us to relate to other people. We've also got sort of powerful mechanisms that put me first. Um, that some neurologists call them the four Fs. <laughs> Fighting, fleeing, feeding, and reproduction. <laughs> So, um, and, and these, are, these are very sort of automatic and aggressive, and if, if a tiger suddenly leapt in here, we're meant to run for our lives and abandon our high-minded um, conversation. And I wrote a book uh, called 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life, and you'll recognize the, um, the reference to Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's quite deliberate because I think we are addicted to our pet hates. We don't know quite what we do without them. We depend upon them for our sense of self. Um, and um, I sometimes look around an audience. Of course, I can't see many of you here in this dim religious light, but I can see a mutinous expression crossing people's faces. What? Can't I ever again say anything vile about my ex-husband or my boss or that annoying sibling? And when we... Uh, it's like the first drink of the evening. When we uh, say something horrible about someone, we get a kind of buzz of pleasure sometimes. This is... Uh, so we have to wean ourselves away fr from this. Uh, you know, sometimes when people are inveighing fiercely against um, an abuse or something, they're often sort of... Um, um, preening themselves with delighted self-congratulation. Ego comes in all the time. Um, and we don't want to get rid of our ego. Uh, it, it's, it's a struggle. But if you do, the great religions all tell us, you start feeling happier. Because you're no longer poised all the time in that defensive, curled up way to ward off attack or to promote yourself or to prance and preen and strut around asserting me, me, me. If you let that go and reach out to put yourself in other people's shoes, you do become happier. Slightly connected, somebody said, on my way here tonight, a young man with dog begged for money. I ignored him. Was that my lack of compassion? Camilla. You tell me. <laughs> I don't know. I worry about this. 
I really do. You're, we're always told, don't give it to beggars, it'll only go on drugs. Um, and then you're in a rush and a hurry, and I always feel bad. Uh, and I, fee I think, given that I am living a life of such extraordinary privilege, you know, just to give sixpence or so, well, what, you know, the new currency, something... Uh, <laughs> um, some, something, I think. But I, 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 I also go past, especially with dogs, somehow. I'm, I'm, an, I, I'm a great dog lover. Um, but also, let's remember the fact that, that there's, there's something very wrong in the way our world is set up. That we are living in this country, most of us, it, or many of us, in such opulence compared with the vast majority of the population. Some people haven't even got clean water. And this is a disgrace. In, uh, and it should, that's why we should be uncomfortable. We should be uncomfortable to see people sitting, begging in the streets in, in a city as rich as this. We should be uncomfortable that, that we, we've created a world in which there is such dangerous inequity of uh, resources and power. And it should rack us night and day. And we sh I think, too, we ought to look, too, if we can, at underlying causes of all this, rather than just handing out donations. What is there structurally in our society that makes beggars? Um, and what is there structurally in our global system that is creating this, this imbalance? I'm thinking of the South American bishop who said, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. Yes. And uh, the compassionate starter would be to ask exactly that question. Um, somebody's obviously been very touched by uh, your stories of, of children, and uh, may I please say that Mind the Child is an exceptionally moving uh, book of stories of, of young people telling stories about, of themselves in a very raw and, and affecting way. And somebody's asked, do you think that people such as those who have starved children of love deserve our compassion? Yes. Absolutely. When I was very young, uh, thank you, <laughs> um, I was sort of in my early 20s and uh, I was training as a psychotherapist, I ended up at a unit uh, in Oxford Gardens that was run by the NSPCC and my job was to be behind the one-way mirror when the therapists were interviewing uh, fathers of children because the courts had sent um, these fathers to this unit to decide whether the father would be someone safe to rehabilitate back into the family when he had actually abused children. And what I saw behind that one-way mirror, because my job was to really uh, look at the whole therapeutic encounter in the room and make further assessments. And what I saw is 99.9% of those men break down in these therapy sessions and talk about the abuse uh, that they themselves had endured. And over the years, as I've worked as a clinician, it's been extraordinary to see how many people who abuse children often use the same strategies that were used when they were abused. That does not mean that everyone who's been abused goes on to abuse others. But it does mean that child abuse, there's always a price to pay. And there is a revenge that comes with child abuse. The revenge can be delivered to someone else or it can be delivered to the self. And there are some people who go on to deliver the disturbance and revenge towards others. And for those people, it is hard, but for those people, we must have compassion too, because somewhere along the line, when they were being harmed, 
someone didn't step in to protect them or to help them with recovery. And it's not absolving them of the moral responsibility to exercise control, but it's understanding when someone fails in control, uh, they have good reason why they failed. And I think I want to come back at you, Karen, because um, it's very easy to be critical of people when we call them egocentric or selfish but, or cruel. And you talked about people uh, enjoying their cruelty. But actually, if you look at the mechanisms of the brain, if you can't calm yourself down and soothe yourself using the front part of your brain, your second best option is to evacuate tension. And one of the best ways to evacuate tension, sadly, is through cruelty. Um, and that cruelty could be towards others or towards the self. Or through intensive exercise, which mimics you having had a good fight. But my point is that the ultimate compassionate position is not to be judgmental about people who are failing to behave pro-socially, but to help them arrive at that pro-social stance. And if we have debates about compassion, we mustn't have debates about being critical about failure of compassion. Because the whole point of compassion is that you also bring along people who are struggling to be compassionate and you embrace them rather than judge them. And I think that's what we've got to be really careful about. I absolutely agree. Uh, because uh, we all have pain. Every single one of us. It's one of the things that draws human beings together. Is that we all have pain. And we all know. I know what I could have been like if I'd not had such an extraordinarily privileged life. Um, we have... Uh, and, and the trick is to look... Ben, ben, and we, it's, I do a lot of this with, when I'm talking to fundamentalist Christians. Because often you can hear in their denunciations a pain. I remember when we were... I was at a conference in 2000 called God at 2000 in uh, the United States. And there were seven of us there, highly talkative individuals, all talking about interfaith and liberalism and all the rest of it. And at the end, of a, a, a fundamentalist erupted in the hall and started screaming at us. We couldn't hear what he was saying exactly. But you could hear the note of pain in the man's voice. And we re and we realized that we had somehow, with our nice liberal ideas, assaulted him. Um, and what was striking to me, too, was that we, none of us highly talkative people could answer him. We were struck dumb, and there was a, a sort of clash there where we both felt, on both sides, felt violated. We were gazing at one another over an impassable divide. And I think that this, this is one of the great the great tricks um, is, is, is to look beneath the rhetoric and to look beneath uh, to, uh, and, and look at, look, decode the imagery in which people speak sometimes as you would decode an article or a poem and recognize the fear and anxiety that often lies at the heart of this uh, because otherwise everything is superficial. <laughs> Uh, the Greeks had it well. When they created tragic drama, they would put on stage the suffering of a, an individual like Oedipus who'd broken every, every taboo in the book. And the chorus would then say to the audience, now weep for this man, weep for this polluted man. And that is, that, it's that fellow feeling of when we, when we understand that the people who are attacking us have their own pain. Uh, and we, we, that's when we begin, I think, to learn a little bit about compassion. The, the Greeks believing that tears bonded you. Yes. Um, yes. Hence compassion. Yes. You know, suffering alongside with 
they real, in the audience, the, people, the Greeks would weep. They weren't like a lot of Western men who would just gulp and wipe away an embarrassed tear, but they would weep aloud because they realized that weeping together created a bond between human beings. Um, and uh, they felt that they were not alone in their pain anymore. Um, and that was, the great, that was the great catharsis, in a sense, mm. of the tragic drama. Mm. Um, and the trick, the real trick, is to realize that your enemies also have pain, which you have, of course, in the Iliad, uh, where uh, Priam and Achilles weep together. The real trick is not to have them as enemies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm. Yeah. You, you've brought up Christians, um, and I think we're very aware of you know, a church that can be more interested in being right than in being loving. Um, a question's come through, how can we persuade the Christian church to show compassion to all people? Would you like to? <laughs> it, well, I, it's not for me to say what the Christian church should do. It's a very sweeping kind of remark, isn't it? Because there's, you know, what is the church but a, a conglomeration of, of individuals. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can say this of any religious community. There's, it, you can get sort of institutionalized in some way, and you can get sort of institutional idolatry or institutional fever, or you can start feeling that you're the only ones. And, uh, but um, I think one of the things that all faith traditions have to do, one of the things that they're doing a lot in the Islamic world, uh, with the Charter, is delve into the tr tradition, look deeply into it, look for the compassionate teaching. Um, they've, they all have them, and very often they get a bit drowned out by other, say, doctrinal issues or, or other, other, other questions. Uh, but if you start really uh, delving, exploring, uh, the complexity of the uh, teaching about compassion, and it's not, this is not an easy matter. Um, you can begin to get that uh, spirit within, uh, within the church. It needs, to, it needs to be brought out. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do with the charter is creating a network of compassionate communities. And what would a compassionate community look like. Uh, in, in, in the United States, the, the, they're, they're creating networks of compassionate mosques, which have to be gender-friendly. Uh, you have to tick some boxes. Gender-friendly, child-friendly, youth-friendly, um, engaged in you know, responsible interfaith conversation. Mm. Um, but seeing it as a... Pr and, and doing this study and learning to bring uh, compassion into the forefront of, of the community life. Camilla, there's one here which I think that you might like to, to start off on, is how can we be compassionate to ourselves? Um, what happens in self-care is that initially you're reliant on your external carer to care for you. And then the idea is that over a period of time, the strategies the external carer used become internalized. And in yourself, you develop an adult, if you like, who then takes care of the child part of you. If you've had uh, care that's been uh, disturbing and uh, perhaps punitive and cruel, you internalize a model where often you are quite cruel to yourself. And um, there is a propensity in society to control people through uh, rules, and you refer to the Christian church, uh, there's a, there's a lot of um, cruel rules often also in the Christian uh, and in religion in general, which isn't the essence of religion. Religion, I think, in its purest form is fundamentally very kind. But as people have tampered with it, 
it's developed um, some very cruel strategies in managing people. So if um, you struggle to be compassionate towards yourself, one of the best places to start is to consider with yourself what kind of a carer have you internalized? Is this carer, this inner carer that you've developed, someone who needs help to do the caring better? And if you needed to do that caring better, uh, is there someone around you who could help you develop a more uh, compassionate internal care agent to do the caring of the child part of you? So I would say if you find yourself cruel to yourself, check where your model is coming from and then check whether you need help to adjust that model and then seek that help. Karen, do you have... I think if, you, if, if we're very, very harsh with ourselves, we'll probably be harsh with other people too. Um, and um, I've struggled with this. Uh, this has been a struggle for me because um, there were time, uh, times when I've been sort of suicidal in my life early as, as a young woman and uh, very much hating myself. Um, and sense of humor helps. You know, a laugh. We are so ridiculous sometimes. Um, and uh, there's a sort of pathos about, about our aspirations and our yearnings. And, but recognize that we have all this badness. We, you know, we have, uh, everyone tells us a shadow side, and we have to visit that from time to time and make friends with it, not saying, okay, so I'll just give in to it. But really, we've all got this. We're all flawed beings. The idea of a saint is a complete myth, a story. Um, we're all deeply flawed beings. Uh, even some of the pe great compassionate people of our, our day, Martin Luther King, they, but look what they achieved. Mm. Um, and in, so instead of uh, j just say, yes, I have my flaws, I have my failings. Um, and, and it's hard if, too, in a target-driven society where we're continually being asked to sort of meet this, that criteria, or have you got this, or uh, that must-have accessory, that all that. Are you thin enough, beautiful enough? Uh, to keep reminding yourself uh, that uh, I have flaws, but then so does everybody else, even some of the people I think revere and think are saints. Do you not think that actually precisely that narrative of conceptualizing aspects of a human being as flawed or unflawed is the essence of the problem. This is, this is a very strange construct we've come up with. Because if people are doing things that are disturbing, they're doing them for good reason. They might not be you know, another person's reasons, but they're doing them for good reason. And I think one of the things we've done in society is that we've structured these judgments where we're saying something is flawed and something is good. And because of that, we're not allowing people to see themselves in the process of evolution. And you wouldn't turn around to a toddler who spits and say, you're a flawed being. You would say, you need to learn over time to control your spitting, you know? And why do we suddenly change this construct when we become adults? Uh, you know, because the problem with that sort of judgment is that you push people to hide the things that they're having difficulty with because you keep referring to them as being flawed. Well, I wasn't really thinking of things we were doing or behavior. I'm thinking of those moments I have of absolute soggy self-pity. Or absolute... But you have them for good reason. But maybe I wish I always thought so. Um, I wish I always thought that this was, you know, not just me being whine, whining and puning and uh, thinking I'm hard done by. When you wake up at three in the morning um, and say, oh, well, you know, 
I failed again, or why have I not done this, and X hates me, and why haven't I got this? I, this it's, it's this kind of uh, white, sort of internal uh, weeping that you feel. Yes, you, I, I, you may have it, but I'd rather not. I'd ra you know, I'd rather, I'd rather be... It. But you just have to live with it. That's what I am. Um, it's what I am, warts and all. Uh, and each day, uh, I'll try to be a compassionate person, and each day there'll be moments when I'm, I fail. I have a very sharp tongue. Um, and um, I, uh, you know, l l would like not to inflict so much pain as I do when I speak But unkindly. You're saying that's not a flaw. I'm saying that's not a flaw. Mm. Okay. Well, I'm saying that that is something that needs attention. It's there for good reason. And the minute you name it as a flaw, you start suppressing it, battling it, negating it, and then you don't pick up the message it has to deliver. Mm, interesting. I was just thinking of uh, Frank Muir, who once said, you know, a saint is just a dead sinner who's been <laughs> dug up and edited. <laughs> Here's a, uh, an important question, I think. Is it possible to be too compassionate? Nobody can keep on and on giving or help everybody. Do we have to close our eyes to some suffering in order to maintain our sanity? How can we draw the line? A few people have asked that. Compassion is your capacity to be generous. When you don't have that capacity, then uh, you, it's because uh, you don't have the resources. And you must respect that, because the whole point of compassion is that it is no longer compassionate if you deliver it by force, i.e., if you make up for yourself a rule, I must be compassionate, and through gritted teeth deliver it, because you're supposed to, then you have already killed off uh, your natural capacity to be kind. So if you find yourself not being kind, just be gentle with yourself and check where you're depleted and then try and replenish that depletion so that when you do want to be kind, it comes from a genuine and clear pathway. So my, my suggestion is if you can't be kind, then that's your truth. Stick to it. Um. I'm thinking in a Buddhist framework now, where a Buddhist will do a meditation whereby he or she sends, tries to send out to all the four corners of the earth compassion without uh, um, emitting a single creature from this radius of concern. A single... But of course... <laughs> You, you don't, you can't, you, you have to start with your own circle and you soon come up against uh, people, to, you know, who, who drive you nuts. Um, it's sometimes easier to feel sort of compassionate for people who are far away than, the, than our immediate neighbors. And again, I quite agree, be gentle with yourself. This is not meant to be a forcing exercise. It's a way of slowly changing your mind. And I wouldn't say compassion is always about kindness. Um, you know, sometimes uh, if you are uh, bringing up um, a child, or you have to say no. Or, uh, or, or, or no is not unkind. No, no can be very kind. Of course, it can. Um, and, and similarly, uh, in our uh, in our sort of relations globally, there are times when people are fouling up. And it's, you know, you need to be, you always have to, to speak clearly and truthfully, but not with animus, I think, uh, in, 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 in that way. Uh, to, to say where people 
where, where we are failing. What needs to be done here? What really needs to be done here that will benefit the most number of people? And it's, it's it, you know, it, it, it's a lifelong endeavor. Um, and as I say, be, be kind and, and gentle to yourself because we have all these other uh, aspects of ourselves by sharp tongue, for example. Somebody's asked, can you train people or yourself to be compassionate? And there's a, it's sort of connected, I think. Somebody's specifically asking uh, Camilla, how do you express love for such troubled children? Do you say, I love you? So it, it's a little bit about how we're doing this. Is it, is it instinctive? Is it something we have to train ourselves or be trained in? It's about a theory of mind. So if you have a very troubled child who is trying to attack you, who is being very abusive, um, you can look at that in two ways. You can either look at that child and say that's a predator against whom I must protect myself. Or you can look at that child and say what has brought that child to the point where they need to protect themselves in such a way through aggression. And what we try and do at Kids Company is to try and get our workers not to be judgmental about uh, the disturbances children present with, but to see them as the child's attempt to protect against insecurity and pain. When you begin to reframe a disturbed piece of behavior and shift it from a predatory attempt to a defensive attempt, your capacity to see the wounded child behind that behavior is enhanced, and then the child picks up that you're not running away from them, but that you are prepared to meet the wounded individual behind the defensive behavior. And in that situation, there is a, a truthful meeting um, of intention from the child and an appropriate response from the worker. And that's what we train our workers to do, to reframe you know, uh, their understanding of these behaviors. Mm. So it is possible to train people in compassion because compassion is really about identifying uh, the vulnerability of another human being and trying to elevate that human being from a position of pain and humiliation to a position of dignity and uh, reparation. And if you uh, understand how to do that and you keep disciplined in doing that, you find that you can get through to the most difficult children uh, through a strategy like that. Thank you. Karen? Um, I uh, found myself unwittingly training myself to be compassionate. I used to be uh, really, as I say, with my sharp tongue and my unhappiness, people used to say, do you realize you never say anything nice about somebody? Um, you know, and, or I'd hate to be your enemy, kind of thing. So, but I started studying other world religions. And I came across a footnote that really turned my life around. It was a, a, a rather dry as dust footnote in a big fat tome, in very small print, but it really spoke to me. It said that the historian of religion must not approach the spiritualities of the past uh, from the vantage point of post-enlightenment rationalism. Uh, so, uh, which is what I was doing. So, well, this is obviously lunatic, you know. Um, uh, uh, so, he said, you must recreate in a scholarly manner all the social, intellectual, economic environment in which this spirituality develops and not leave it at asking yourself continually, but why? Until you can imagine uh, that in circumstance, uh, certain circumstances, you would yourself 
have felt the same. And he said, if you do that, you uh, broaden your horizons and make a place for the other in your mind. And I found that I thought that makes sense, and it transformed my view of religion, but it also very much transformed the way. I related to other people too, because you, if you're doing it all day and every day at your desk, it rubs off. So that instead of continually being on the on the defensive and angry and desiring to push, to try to、uh, broaden your horizons and think, if I were in that person's shoes, I could imagine myself feeling or doing the same. Um, so I think we all we all have moments when, like that footnote,、mm. in our lives, it may come to us in a novel or a poem or、um, a、uh, re- reading a, a learned book or something you've seen on television.、Uh, but you, we all have moments where we can say, "Well, this is the way. For, this is the way for me." There's time, I think, for just. A couple more questions. We're, we're thinking in this series about change. We're thinking about future. And the questions come in here: What opportunities and shortcomings do you see in the education system for compassion? I wonder if you'd like to begin. I would like to love Michael Gove into a more compassionate position. So I'm sending that out to him. And. The reason I'm saying that to you is because we're in a climate where children have、um, almost become a commodity,、mm-hmm. in the sense that we perceive childhood as a waiting room for adulthood, and then we think that we've got to skill up these children so that they can become economically viable. So, if you look at our public discourse. We're constantly talking about attainment, and what is very important to understand is that until a child has emotional and spiritual stability and a sense of security, the law of survival dictates that they are not going to pay attention to enhancing their skills when their preoccupation is their survival, and. What I want to see in our political leaders is an understanding that whilst they talk about a set of children acquiring skills for the future, they also need to understand that there are some 1.5 to 2 million children who are struggling with childhood because there isn't the protection and the security there for them, and that as a children's minister, the minister responsible for children, it is imperative. To talk also about the children who survived the underbellies of our city、uh, and who survived the underbelly of childhood, and that can only happen if our ministers have the ability to place themselves in the living shoes of these children. And、um, so, the answer to your question is: before we can have compassion in our education system. We have to generate it in our political system first. Karen,、um, I would absolutely agree with all that. Of course,、um, let's just little a look at the curriculum. It's a long time since I've been involved in education of any sort, but、uh, I wish. Uh, that the humanities could be valued a bit more in the curriculum than they were. That there could be that lang. I, fi- I think it's shocking that now lang- learning a language, another language, if you are able, if you have the intellectual capacity to do that, is now not part of you know the the, the, the syllabus、uh, because. When you learn another language, I, I say this because I am myself not good at languages.、Uh, but、um, when you learn another language, you realise there's always another way to say something. 
it helps you to shift your point of view and be a bit more flexible. Literature, poetry, all these things train you when you're reading a novel. You are inhabit using your imagination and inhabiting somebody else's life, perhaps in another society, in another, um, uh, another country, another era. And you are, you are, it's an exercise in putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Uh, and I feel that obviously mathematics and science are crucial and very important. Uh, but also to educate the imagination and the heart and history. We should learn about our own history, warts and all, and also learn about the history of other peoples. Uh, because it's like, you, it's very difficult to get to know anyone really well if you don't know what's happened to them in the past, what their pains been, what have they suffered, uh, what have been their great achievements, what have been their great moments of revelation. And if we don't learn about other uh, cultures, other societies, again, how can we possibly create good relations in our global village? So a, a little bit more on the humanities there. So I'm going to ask you now because... Um, <laughs> The apple of time has fallen in the orchard of eternity, and we have to uh, <laughs> and we have to keep an eye on eight o'clock. So, can I can I ask you both finally for a, a last thought? Because if they're like me, sitting out there, they're starting to feel a bit restless here. Mm, what can I be doing? How can I change my world, the world? What can we do now? Can we have a last thought for the audience to take away about? how to change the world to and with compassion? Um, don't think big. Uh, compassion is somewhere right under your nose. Um, when you're ready, you'll find it. And then, um, if you express it, live through it, I promise you that you're going to get one of the biggest highs you've ever come across. So try it for me. Karen? Uh, Confucius said uh, when we talk about what he called compassion, uh, we think it's far away, but he said, but it's here. It is here. We have it already. It's in us. Uh, it's there to be awakened. But what on a practical method, just look around your world. Look at your family. How could I personally make my family a little happier? Are there any black sheep in this family? Are there people who are left out or who feel overburdened? What can I do in this family or in the workplace? How can, are there, how can my presence make this workplace a kinder, uh, more constructive and creative place. Uh, it, we all have to begin with ourselves too. And uh, to, 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 to be gentle and take it step by step, quietly. Um, and it is a rewarding journey. Don't feel burdened by it. Uh, compassion can be a lot of fun. Just a little reminder that this event this evening has been recorded, videoed, and will be available uh, on the St. Paul's website, and you'll be able to send the link to Michael Gove. <laughs> Our next conversation in this series is in three weeks' time, Tuesday the 15th of October, when uh, Shami Chakrabarti and Bishop Peter Selby will be reflecting on freedom. Please do tell your friends and colleagues and bring them along with you. 
A reminder that Camilla's and Karen's books are for sale when we end in a minute and they will be signing copies. And a very important reminder, a retiring collection will be taken as you leave for Kids' Company and you can learn more about their work over there and about Charter for Compassion over there on the two tables. As I've been sitting here, I've been thinking that a very important message has been circulating that actually flies in the face of so many of the messages that we're receiving from very big places. The message, it seems, is that actually a human self is most itself when not being selfish. And that's not a bad lesson for us to take out as we now begin thinking how we're going to change the world. Nelson Mandela has been on many hearts and minds over the last weeks. And I want to end with something he said. Our human compassion binds us the one to the other, not in pity or patronizingly, but as human beings who have learned how to turn our common suffering into hope for the future. I hope you agree, in fact I know you do, that the two people sitting with me here are offering hope for our future and on behalf of you I want to thank them both very much tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much.